Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Don Smith, and I am the host of the Sherlock Conversations. I am honored by the many guests I have on the I've had the chance to interview, and this has got to be one of the top honors for me. I am on the phone with Fraser Heston, the son of the legendary Charlton Heston, and Charlton has been known for playing a couple of smaller roles, i.e. Moses, Ben-Hur. I'm sure those will probably pop up at some point in time, but I am really excited to talk with Fraser, Fraser, excuse me, Fraser, um, and about directing the movie, The Crucifer of Blood, which starred his father playing Sherlock Holmes, and this was on uh, TNT back in the 1990s. Fraser, Fraser, I'm so sorry. I'm going to keep doing that. Um <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate that. Well, Don, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, able to talk to you about a subject that I'm uh, hopefully as passionate about as as your uh, as your audience is. Right now, first of all, I want to I want to go ahead and I want to talk about this because obviously a lot of the people know. Um, I, I I did a quick YouTube search for just other talking points to just uh, get to know you a little bit more. And you were talking about Ben-Hur. You were talking about um, the Ten Commandments and other movies like that. But I also want to bring up that you are an absolutely accomplished writer. You are an accomplished director. And one of the things I wanted to highlight is this wonderful, wonderful mystery that we will have a review up on the Sherlock Conversations within the next week or two called Desolation Sound. And you wrote this with uh, Heather, um, Heather McAdams, and it's based on a true story. And I was wondering if we could talk about that for a little bit. Well, thanks. Uh, and thanks for the nice comment on Desolation Sound. Uh, Heather and I came across this story a few years ago. I was traveling up in British Columbia where uh, uh, we used to have property up in Whistler, B.C., uh, and we do a lot of sailing up in the uh, coast of B.C., and a number of severed human feet have been washing up on the shores of British Columbia uh, for the last, uh, oh, I guess about eight years. I think it started in 2008. And the RCMP has investigated and decided in their wisdom that there's no sign of foul play. In other <laughs> words, it's, there's no obvious tool marks on the bones, presumably, or something like that. Right. But uh, either there are, uh, and I think it's up to 14 or 15 severed feet right now, and most of them don't match. So there are probably either, you know, a bunch of people walking around missing feet that haven't said anything about it, <laughs> or there are, are, you know, 14 or 15 bodies on, laying on the floor of the Strait of Georgia that we don't know how they got there. And uh, so that kind of, you know, really sparked my interest because I always love, uh, you know, unsolved mysteries and mysteries in general and detective stories are obviously a huge part of my kind of oeuvre, right. and uh, that kind of got us thinking, well, maybe we should write a novel based on, loosely, on this uh, this idea, and then we will provide fictional characters and uh, fictional antagonists and a few twists and turns along the way. Gotcha. How long did, um, and one of the things that I also find very fascinating about the book is, if I can just talk about the uh, publishing process, is you did this independently. And we did. We, we we looked into it a little bit, and you know you can get a, a, a publisher to publish a, a first time novel. Uh, it's not impossible, but uh, the, the the returns are pretty small. Right. And uh, and then you don't really own the publishing rights. So we we also looked into the notion of publishing it on Amazon.com, uh, both in hardback and on Kindle, and we decided to go ahead and go that route. And then we controlled the and of course had to pay for. The marketing, advertising, publicity, uh, social media, and all of that stuff that you know one has to to do to promote a novel that way, and we were pleasantly uh, surprised with with the response. We got great reviews. Right. We got wonderful reader response. If you go on our Amazon page, you'll see uh, uh, a lot of the reader reviews there, and uh, we just had a great time with it. Uh, I just got off the phone, oddly enough, with a producer in Canada who wants to develop a uh, six-part series. Uh, for Canadian and uh, U.S. TV. Oh, interesting. Um, so, so that hopefully will will come to pass. Oh well, I hope it does too, because it's <coughs> it's a great novel and it's really well written. Now, I wanted to ask this: 
when you're working on this with another person, how much of this is you start writing something, then she looks at it, or is it kind of like you wrote something, then she went back and said, I like these first two paragraphs, the last three pages are terrible, let me rewrite them. How did you guys do the process of that? Well, I said to Heather, I want you to do all the work and I'll take all the credit. <laughs> um, no, in, you know, in actual fact, we had worked together before on several screenplays, uh, which we developed here at Agamemnon Films, which is my company right. that I started with my dad about 30 years ago. And <clears throat> um, Heather and I started outlining and coming up with scenes and dialogue, and because we're both screenwriters, she's also an actor, it's very easy for us to kind of improvise dialogue together, and then we'd write that down on a yellow pad, and one or the other of us would, would write the scene, and then the other one would come in with some additional material or some critique or say, you know, that's great, that thing about the gun in that scene, but really we don't want to reveal that he has the gun there. That's got to be done later. Right. So we go, right, 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 so we'll save that beat for, for another moment. And, and we would kind of plot it out, and then we would sort of red team it. You know how in military jargon, one team will decide on, on a strategic or tactical plan of action, and, and then they'll appoint some other military strategist to knock holes in it and say, well, what would the enemy do if confronted with this scenario? And, you know, that's what they did, uh, for example, in the hunt for bin Laden. Right. Uh, and so we tend to do that. We'll say, all right, now let's play the red team and find out what's wrong with it. Like, what are the plot points and what are the holes in the plot? If this guy is on the island and he's accounted for on the island and the murder takes place off the island, how can he be a suspect? Right. In the murder, we've just given him an alibi, so we can't do that. And we, we actually did discover quite a few things that we had to go back because it's so tightly plotted, there's so many twists and turns, and there's a lot of, of uh, you know, reverses and, and twists that, that we had to be very, very careful with that kind of stuff. Because we know how astute readers right. are. I am. I always get annoyed where I go, wait a minute, the guy's in his office. Of course he didn't kill him. Right, right. No. Right. Oh, that's so funny, because one of the things that um, I've always found, especially when writing a mystery, and I uh, just got done, I actually, this past year, I wrote my first uh, Sherlock Holmes story ever. And what amazed me was that um, I couldn't write it from beginning to end. I had to know everything. Because like, it's sort of like when you're doing any sort of mystery, you almost have to know, okay, the murderer was born 30 years ago. And here is why he committed the murder. Here is how he committed the murder. Here's how he got away mm -hmm. with it. At what point mm -hmm. does our um, protagonist come in and start investigating things? And then you almost have to – then you say, like, now Joe over here will be a suspect. How, like, uh, what I found was I actually had to write it in scenes almost. It was almost like, you know, shooting a movie. Like, you first film the beginning uh, – you first film the ending of the movie. Then you may film the beginning of the movie and then film – Film different parts of it and then assemble it all together, and that's basically how I wrote that. How did was it? I think that's a great methodology, and you know, on the one hand, mysteries and let's just include detective stories, right. crime fiction in general, whodunits, thrillers, all of that stuff from Stephen King to, you know, uh, uh, John D. McDonald, right. which is another of my literary pinup boys, um, and you know, I think they're both of those guys are giants in the field. And especially Stephen, who's now, you know, entered the sort of crime fiction realm with Mr. Mercedes and right. the whole trilogy. Um, I think that, uh, you know, basically you have to say to yourself, on the one hand, I want it to be plotted correctly, and it has to make sense. It has to be organic. It has to kind of seem natural. But and there can't be any holes in it. Right. But on the other hand, you can drive yourself crazy over plotting something, and you've got something that's all substance and no style. And if you look at both, you know, um, John D. McDonald and the Sherlock Holmes stories and uh, Stephen King, the, you know, they're as, as heavily reliant upon the, the, the style, the mood, the dialogue, the character, as they are upon the plots. It's it's and and to respond to your notion about the the cinematic technique, I think we tend to think of detective stories and thrillers in cinematic terms, uh -huh. in the way other novels are are, you know, more subjective and can detail you know can be more kind of 
uh, uh, stream of consciousness or something like that. Right. In in detective novels, you you have to withhold information from the audience. Don't right. You, you right. can't tell them everything up front because even if you know who did it, and and in the case of Stephen King's work, it's not a who done it. You know the guy. You know the perpetrator. Right. It's a matter of catching him and not getting getting killed in the process. Um, and and it's often that case in in Sherlock Holmes, where where in in given stories you may know who the murderer is, but 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 you can't prove it. Uh, Sherlock is often way ahead of the audience. On the other hand, so the uh, Conan Doyle has withheld information that is in the mind of his protagonist, but isn't in the mind of of the audience yet because he hasn't chosen to reveal that. Right, right. And he holds that off until the end. So that's all kind of cinematic storytelling, isn't it? Right, yeah, it's exactly. like you think in scenes and plot points and, okay, how do I reveal that the guy is hiding behind the door with a knife when the girl comes in to the, to the bedroom? Right. Yeah. You you need the audience to see the guy behind the door with the knife for that bit of suspense to work. On the other hand, if you'd rather surprise them and scare the crap out of them, then you don't show the guy behind the door with a knife. She comes in, the guy leaps out, scares the hell out of them. Right, right. So you have to decide. And that's all cinematic storytelling. Right, exactly. I mean, it's one of those things like back in the day whenever you would watch the um – uh, the serials, like you know, you know, back in the day when people were like uh, kids, kids in the 40s and 50s are going to see like the Adventures of Buck Rogers and everything. And right when something is about to happen, Buck the cowboy or whoever it is is holding on to the um, side of the cliff, and then it says, "Tune in next week." Well, then next week you find out, oh yeah, by the way, there just happened to be a rope hanging off to the side. <laughs> that the guy could reach for it. And you could get away with that, by the way, in that milieu in those days. Right. Right? I mean, I mean, you could get away with that, and, and your audience would forgive you for writing that rope in, in between episodes. But now I don't think you could get away with that. So that would be something you'd have to go, I better establish that rope earlier on that the guy uses it for climbing up the cliff or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And and then it's not a surprise. You haven't pulled it out of thin air. Yeah, exactly, because to an extent it becomes like the magic wand that you see in the Harry Potter stuff where it's just kind of like, uh-oh, how do I get out of this? Well, fortunately, I have my magic wand, point at it, boom. I'm and, at and by the way, what is the worst example of magic wand writing in modern uh, uh, cinema, whether it's detective or thrillers or whatever? It's the cell phone or the computer. Because you can do anything with a computer or a cell phone now, and a cell phone is a computer, right. after all. Right. So, you know, bad writing will just have people writing their way out of plot points by just getting on the phone. Right. And and you have to you have to avoid that. It's all too easy. Right. Exactly. That's why a lot of the stuff I tend to write tends to be in the 1990s before cell phones were as common. Yeah. Yeah. Were. Yeah. And and so does Stephen King, by the way. He does a lot of that. You know, or if there's a cell phone, it's like the brick phone. It doesn't have the smartphone technology. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Now. Um, I wanted to take this back a little bit further, um, and specifically, um, obviously, you, um, you you have a very – I'm going to almost say you have a very cheerful obligation. I have seen you do interviews where you talk about your father's legacy, and and you really, really – genuinely seem very happy to keep that legacy alive and that really kind of really makes it really made my day to see you talking about talking about it like the 50th anniversary of ben-hur when you were talking about finding the old footage and your father's journal that he typed all the time and also uh when he was nominated into the cowboy hall of fame and you were talking about how this is truly an american uh, thing, and I thought to myself as I was watching this, I said, "You know what's funny is, you really go out of your way to keep your father's legacy alive." And I still am fortunate; I have my father, but I just couldn't imagine. My father worked as a distributor for a, for a big car company. I just couldn't imagine me being the one going. I've got to be the one to pick up that slack. I would just go. I don't care. Find somebody else to distribute the cars. My dad's more <laughs> interested in uh, in selling um, uh, Kona ice down to people in Florida. That's what he's all about now. Do you have some sort of? Um, well, you know, I think that there is definitely a, a certain element of keeping the flame, Mm -hmm. uh, which is my responsibility. But I don't really see myself as, you know, in, as having a huge obligation to keep that flame alive. I think it's doing very well on its own. I think my father has a wonderful legacy 
as an artist, as a husband, as a father, as an American, um, and as a human being, that anyone who knew him or knew his work or was involved in him, with him uh, in some way politically or whatever, even if they were on the other side of an issue, came to respect him and usually came to like him. And, and as a consequence, I think his legacy is doing quite well. Um, but, but there is an element of, of, you know, there are things that I think are interesting about his life that I yeah. want people to know. Uh, we cooperated with uh, a new biography of my dad, uh, which is called Charlton Heston, The Last Hollywood Icon, written by a chap named Mark Elliott. And uh, that's going to be out next spring, I believe. Oh, wow. And it's the definitive biography. It's this massive tome, but it reads like a novel. I picked it up, and I, I called Mark back two days later. I said, you ruined my life because I can't put this book down, <laughs> and I know how it comes out. <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> I know the story. And he's really gone back in detail and researched all this. And, and we advised him on a lot of stuff and gave him interviews and photographs and all of that stuff. But, you know, I think it's in our interest to do that. And he didn't have any particular agenda with it one way or the other except to tell a good story. And I think my dad's life is a good story. Right, right. Now, and, well, I was going to ask, um, your father up until about the early 1980s, um, he was known, obviously, for these, I'm going to call them <clears throat> epic Mideastern heroes, meaning that, like, mm-hmm. specifically Ben-Hur... <laughs> Uh, well, because they, yeah. they were set in the Mideast and everything. and um, Yeah, and, if, and by the way, if you want to go a little further west, you could include El Cid in that, yes, too. Yes, yes. Although he was a Spaniard, but that's part of that old Moorish invasion. Right. You know, it's all part of that same movie. Right. Um, do you remember when he said, because uh, the big deal is, is that he was actually playing Sherlock Holmes on the stage in Los Angeles. And right. I was going to ask, do you remember when he said, I, I want to play Sherlock? Were you going, wait, 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 you're this gruff cowboy type of fighter warrior person. The idea of him playing a Victorian gentleman that... Uh, yeah, who's also a cocaine addict. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was really interesting because he, he came across that script. It was written by Paul Giovanni. Right. Um, and uh, as a play originally, I don't think there was a, a, a book. Um, and what Paul did is he took his favorite bits from various stories, principally the sign of four, right. and put them into one marvelous kind of, you know, enthusiastic uh, 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 sort of song, as, as it were, um, to, to Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, and, and Dr. Watson. And there's just a lot of love of those characters in that script and a lot of very good craft, you know, most of which just celebrates what Conan Doyle did, but in a wonderful way right. that was a lot of fun for an audience. And it played when, when he performed it. I think the first time I saw it, it was on at the Amundsen Theater here in L.A. Uh-huh. at the Center Theater Group. And he later did it in England and elsewhere in the U.S. And And there was a lot of theatricality in it. There were scenes where things disappeared and there was a ship that came out of the fog onto the stage and and there was you know the little midget right. with, from the Andaman Islands with the uh, with the uh, uh, blowpipe and all of that cool stuff and the lightning bolt landing and the crucifer appearing in the window and scared the shit out of the audience. Oh, that's awesome. People would scream, you know, they'd scream. It was great. It was like evocative and moody and fantastic. And so obviously he saw that in the script and and decided, you know what, as he did in every part that he took on, uh, he said, here's a good story and a good character. So I think I can play that guy. I think I can be this man, and I think I can give the audience something to sink their teeth into as I'm going to sink my teeth into this part. So that right. was kind of the criteria that I believe he and, and most good actors would use. It's not about, oh, well, I think this will be successful or hip or whatever, or reach out to a contemporary audience, as they say, or, you know, because here's something that's, that, that's more than 100 and some odd years old. Uh, but it turns out, yes, contemporary audiences are fascinated by Sherlock Holmes, as we've seen with the endless number of, of, of uh, you know, imitations, regurgitations, and remakes on TV and film and so on. Um, 
So I think that was his process, that kind of organic process. Right. He didn't reverse engineer it and say, how can I develop a hit out of this or something like that. Right, right. And, you know, sure, he liked doing biblical characters and historical characters. Mostly he played, you know, a lot of people say he played great men, and I guess you would say Sherlock Holmes is a great man. But I would say, from his point of view, he would be more inclined to term it he played interesting men. Right. Whether it was, you know, a, a Jewish prince who's confronted with the with the specter of revenge and redemption and, you know, against the backdrop of the of the the you know, the whole Christ story. Right. Or or a Spanish knight that nobody's ever heard of who's serving a good knight serving an unworthy sovereign in L C. You know, those are really two very different guys. Right, right. Uh but they kind of get lumped into the same category. Um Right. Or, or you know, astronaut uh, Colonel Taylor, who ends up on a planet in the future that's inhabited by talking apes. Right, right, yeah. I've heard you know, who's that guy? And he wasn't even a very likable character. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's a very interesting part, isn't it? Yeah. You're confronted by an interesting story. Well, if I may say, one of the things that has always, like, that has always struck me about Sherlock, the character of Sherlock Holmes, is, is that he always reminded me of a saber, like a fencing saber. And the roles that your father played reminded me of almost a Scottish broadsword. And <laughs> and what it honestly was, what, what was fascinating about seeing the movie that uh, ultimately um, I want to get to was, it was like watching somebody fence with a broadsword and doing an amazing job <laughs> of it. That's a great analogy. I, I, I really like that. I think Dad would would like that as well. I think what he tried to do is to adapt the tools of his trade, which are, after all, the actor's craft, right, right? whatever right. he can bring to the part, in terms of interpreting the role, what sort of man are we playing, how does he interpret that person, um, and how does he deliver the lines and the emotion and the character that goes into that. Dad saw himself as as a real actor. I think he saw himself as more of a stage actor than a movie star. Oh, that's so funny. He didn't like the word movie star at all. Uh, he, he didn't want to be a movie star. He wanted to be an actor. And so when given something that, as I said, he can sink his teeth into, and there's plenty of meat in Crucifer Blood and certainly in Sherlock, uh, for any good actor to sink their teeth into, as, as you know, Benedict Cumberbatch has so aptly demonstrated, right. you, you can tell the guy's having a lot of fun with that part. And I think, yes, he, Sherlock is more of a rapier, whereas El Cid and Moses are, are clearly broader weapons. Yeah. Um, but I think as an actor, he enjoyed that. Um, he enjoyed that subtle sophistication and that kind of rapier-like wit, which, by the way, is a term that's been used before right, uh, right. to describe Sherlock, right. and, and rightfully so. Um, uh, so I, I think he delighted in that opportunity to play somebody like that. Whereas, let's say, Long John Silver, who in many ways was was another wonderful character that Dad and I did together when we made Treasure Island with Christian Bale, of all things, back in the day oh, when so Christian funny. was about 17 years old. Uh, you know, Dad really sank his teeth into Long John and made him seem more human, I think, more real, more, more you know, I don't want to say sophisticated, but but more meaty. As as a part, and then just a yard gym lad, yeah, so you know, with a guy with a parrot on his shoulder. Yeah, because that's what you go back to is automatically that whenever I think Treasure Island, I think back to the um, to that really large sweaty guy that has a five o'clock shadow that had the red coat on that always was like dar <laughs> dar. And I remember seeing your I remember seeing your father playing that on TV, and I just was like yeah. Charlton Heston playing Long John Silver, like, huh? I wouldn't put the two of them together like that, but it was it was fascinating. Now, let me ask this: when he was doing the um, doing the preparation for playing playing the role on stage, would he do the uh, would he actually like work with a, a voice coach trying to get down the uh, trying to get down a British accent? Was he rereading the characters? Did he stay away from like if you you know he just happened to be up at one in the morning and they're replaying uh, the Basil Rathbone stuff? Jay-Z's like, nope. <laughs> no, I would say he did all of the above. It's yes to everything. Uh, he he did work with a voice coach. His name was Bob Easton, and he primarily worked on accents, uh, getting regional accents exact. Uh, Bob was uh, something of a genius at that. Uh, he was used by studios for many different films. He was a good actor himself and was in a couple of cool pictures. 
Um, and he could do, if you could name the accent, he could do it. Oh, interesting. And he could teach it to you if you were a good actor. So Dad worked really hard on that. He played a lot of Englishmen, but he would, every time he would do another English role, he would call up Bob and say, you know, how do you think Sherlock Holmes should sound? What sort of, you know, background does he have? Where did he go to school? Where, where you, you, you know, what, what's he going to sound like? And that helps, I think, in his mind as well as the audience to sort of inhabit that role, doesn't it? It gives you, if you know what he sounds like, you know what sort of guy he is. Right. And vice versa. Vice versa as well. It, you know, cuts both ways. Uh, he would also uh, do a lot of research and reading. He would always read historical material. And obviously in the case of of, of Holmes, there's a magnificent canon of right, Conan Doyle right. stories that you can delve into and a lot of the sequels and, and imitations and remakes and homages and all of that. Um, I think he loved doing that. That was part of why he liked being an actor. I mean, he had this, this reading chair in his study up in the house on Coldwater Canyon, and uh, he would get in there at about 5 in the morning and start reading stuff, whether it was historical books or novels or scripts or whatever and and obviously he would then add to that any film that he thought was you know pertinent that would pertain to to the project or the the character he would watch those as well so he tried to be a sponge and soak it all right up. right I, oh that's amazing now i i would be completely remiss if i didn't bring this up at all his Watson on stage, of all the people that it would turn out to play his Watson, I can't believe, he worked with Jeremy Brett. Jeremy Brett played Watson to Charlton Heston, Sherlock Holmes. Do you? <laughs> I thought Jeremy was wonderful. I, that just is uh, so that amazing. And Jeremy went on to play uh, Sherlock. Yeah, exactly. He? That's what, like, like, yeah. like well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Right before I called, I was talking to another Sherlock buddy of mine. And one of these days, I'm going to sit down and I'm actually going to write it out. I believe that Sherlock fandom can actually be divided into ages. And a lot of those ages are characterized by the um, by the actor playing Sherlock at the time, and I was saying how mm-hmm, you have mm-hmm. your Doyle age, you have your William Gillette age, which bleeds into mm-hmm. the Basil Rathbone age, which eventually bleeds into the uh, Nicholas Meyer age, which then bleeds into the Jeremy Brett age, which then bleeds into the Cumberbatch age, and I believe, and the thing is, is that it's that's who's dominating Sherlock, and now it's not, yeah. um, it's it's not well defined it's not like you can say like oh this age ended on J- no on they the overlap age. yeah sure yeah but it's like they overlap and everything and your father was right there in the middle of the jeremy bread age and i find it so fascinating that probably a good ton of what you saw in the granada could honestly probably be traced back to maybe your father having some sort of influence i'm not saying that jeremy didn't have like play his own but i guarantee you that him playing watson on must have put a bug in his ear for the role when the opportunity came up well sure i think you know you've got to remember they're both professional actors right and if dad was tasked with the role of playing dr watson i'm sure he could deliver a creditable performance in that and the same obviously goes for jeremy brett as we've seen uh, good actors can play almost anything and, you know, in, in Christopher Blood, Dad got to play a Chinaman, although right. he was playing Sherlock Holmes playing a Chinaman. Um, <laughs> Fung Ching, I think, the proprietor of the opium den. Yeah, I was actually going to um, bring that up in a few, but uh, no, but that, that was really funny how he did that, because I was like... Wait, yeah, <laughs> he was great. He loved that. And he studied the Chinese accent, too, by the way, for that, uh, with Bob Easton. So to go back to your point about Jeremy, you know, again, a highly professional, highly trained actor. These guys love doing this right. stuff. You know, if you said to Jeremy, could you play Lady Macbeth, I'll bet he could deliver a really good performance as Lady Macbeth. Right. Um, and, you know, you, you, these guys like to be challenged. So Jeremy, I think, was a, a, an almost uh, perfect Sherlock in the Granada series. But, um, you know, I think he was an excellent Dr. Watson, too. Uh, right. our, I forgot why Jeremy was not available to play Dr. Watson, but we ended up, in my film, but we ended up uh, with Richard Johnson, whom I'd worked with uh, uh, on uh, Crucifer Blood. I'm sorry, on Treasure Island right. before that, where he played Squire Trelawney. And he also was in a film my dad made about Gordon of Khartoum. Okay. As well, with Laurence Olivier. Oh, so wow. they'd worked together again. Again, a wonderful English 
theatrically trained actor, and, and don't the English have marvelous actors like that, as we've seen so many I, times. I've got to say, one of the most important things for anybody playing Sherlock and Watson are the uh, chemistry. And I thought the two of them had a really good chemistry together. That... Yeah, they were good together, weren't they? They were really good, and they, they, they I think they provided a kind of sort of, you know, that tennis match that goes on where... where Holmes is always one step ahead of Watson. He's always ribbing him and needling him and challenging him. But but it's it's the, the you know the same sort of thing that, that that two old buddies who you know like to go watch baseball or play tennis or go fishing together or something. It's kind of like grumpy old men. Yeah, you know, yeah. And they really <laughs> they love and respect each other too. And as Holmes says, I'd be lost without my Boswell. Right, right. Meaning his, his meaning his biographer. Right. Of Real quick, I, I just wanted to touch on this. What type of chemistry did your father and Jeremy Brett have, both on stage and off stage? Did your father ever say anything about working with him, or? Oh, they got along very well. I think Dad had a lot of respect for Jeremy. Um, you know, Dad loved real actors, uh-huh. and he loved working with pros. Uh, and, and I'm sure Jeremy felt the same way about Dad. I mean. Dad was so professional and so punctual and so uh, uh, careful about learning his lines and and being respectful of other performances and being generous as an actor um, that most actors that he worked with really admired and and respected him. And and I think that cut both ways. Gotcha. Now, I want to get this back to you for a minute. Um, So I'm imagining 1989, 1990 comes around. And the idea of making a Crucifer of Blood uh, movie is popping up. How did you get involved with this? How did uh, Was it your father that said, you know, my son's a pretty good director. Let's do this. Or you guys had done Treasure Island. Was this just a continuation of, um, hey, we've, we've done this project together. Let's do something else. How about Crucifer of Blood? It, it was a little bit of both. I had always wanted to do a Sherlock Holmes. Um, I had always wanted to make... Uh, a film with Dad as as Sherlock Holmes in Crucifer Blood. Ever since I saw him on stage, I thought, "Wow, this would make a great film." Mm. We'd been toying with that for some time, um, and when the opportunity came around to do another picture with Turner, we'd already done A Man for All Seasons based on the Robert Bolt play. Right. Uh, then we did Treasure Island, and you know, uh, Ted Turner was very enthusiastic about that, and so we he kind of said, "What do you want to do next?" And I said, "Let's do Sherlock Holmes. Let's do." Uh, Crucifer Blood, and Dad, I think, had uh, was in the process of doing it again on stage in England at that time, and it was very successful, and uh, we really enjoyed uh, that that production. So we thought, well, that's a natural, and we were working with uh, Peter Snell, uh, our friend and producer, who mm. produced Antony and Cleopatra and Julius Caesar with my father and had also co-produced Motherload with me, an early film that we'd made together, as well as both The Man for All Seasons and Treasure Island. So we had this little triumvirate going, and we said, well, let's do Crucifer Blood. This is a natural, and, you know, it's the kind of thing that Turner loved, and Ted himself loved it. So it just seemed like it was, you know, green green light all around. Oh. And we just kind of dove into it. I started working on the script, and... Uh, it was really, it was a, a piece of cake to write. You know, all I had to do is just turn it into shots and scenes. Right, right. right. Was there ever any, like, okay, let's let's leave the, um, let's, just for argument's sake, let's just leave your father out of this. How was it for you taking on this character? I mean, like, again, you've got the Basil Rathbone movies. You've had Peter Cushing at this point in time playing it. And even Christopher Plummer has play, played it twice. And um, also at the same time, um, the Granada series is getting some steam because they popped up in the mid-80s. For you, was there ever at any point like taking on a character like this, was it ever overwhelming? Because Sherlock, is, <laughs> is, is, it's, it's not like you're playing, uh, it's not like you're creating an original character. You're doing something that, no matter what it is, has, for lack of a better word, a lot of baggage to it. Well, there's nothing like youth, enthusiasm, and naivete <laughs> to, to drive your engine in something like that. You know, I probably should have been worried about all those things, but it never occurred to me. 
uh, at the time. I had a lot of confidence, and I just couldn't wait to get into Sherlock Holmes. You know, it was so much fun. Literally, I just couldn't wait to start writing, and every day I'd know exactly what I wanted to say next. And, you know, if I was, I did do a lot of original research. I went back and read everything and watched everything and tried to absorb, you know, as much as I could of, of Conan Doyle's original intention right. as I did with, uh, you know, Treasure Island and Robert Louis Stevenson. I, I wanted to make the most authentic version of Treasure Island that I could. And while also remaining true to the play Crucifer of Blood, I wanted to go back and kind of reference Conan Doyle's intent as well and, and not try to be too clever with it and update things and modernize it and, and so on. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, that can work too, as we've seen with the... Uh, the uh, the Elementary series, right. for example, which is a modernized version of it. That's also very successful. I enjoyed it. I watch it um, with Johnny, uh, what's the actor's name? Johnny, Johnny Lee Miller. Uh, yeah, he's great. Yeah. I mean, he's awesome. I wish he would talk a little clearer. I have a lot of trouble understanding his accent. Yeah. Because uh, he has that sort of modern London accent. But uh, in any case, uh, to go back to Christopher, uh, it was really just a, a labor of love for me from start to finish. Uh, we just had a great time filming it, great time casting it. We got some of the best English actors around, Edward Fox and so on. Um, and, you know, we were able to use some great original locations in Victorian London, like Camden Locks, you know, the little right, thing right. The, with the steamboat and, and the docks down in the River Thames with the ship and all of that. Um, and the Pondicherry Lodge was a wonderful uh, original old uh, manor house that we found not far from Pinewood Studios where we were working. Oh, that is... So it was really kind of a filmmaker's dream to make that movie, to tell you the truth. Right. Now, my next question, obviously, is like, you're, you're not only like you're you're attacking a Sherlock Holmes project, you're working with Charlton Heston, which must have had a whole other level to this. Did you view this as... I'm directing Dad, or I'm directing Charlton Heston, or did they all of a sudden kind of those kind of thoughts intertwine with each other? Where you're de- like you're dealing with three very, very powerful forces here, where it's like you got your Sherlock legacy. Um, I get to order my father around. No, Dad, you didn't do it right. One more time. And then the third thing around is, like, you're taking on an actor that is probably at this point in time, like he's still part of the golden age of Hollywood that was like, uh, waving the banner of this is what it means to be an actor and a man of character too, that you just don't mm-hmm. see as much anymore. Were those at all intimidating for you? No, because I didn't look on him as, as an international famous movie star. I looked on him as first of all, my father, mm-hmm. obviously, um, and we got along very well. Uh, we lived in adjoining flats in the Athenaeum Hotel and uh, right off Piccadilly in London. Uh, we, we lived rather like Holmes and Watson. In fact. <laughs> we would have breakfast together frequently. and We would share a car to save some money for the production and go out to the studio together if we had, you know, if Dad was called right. on the same day. And uh, we would have dinner maybe three or four nights a week. Uh, we'd walk down the street through the fog and... and uh, have dinner at a Greek restaurant or a fish place we knew. So it, it was, in, in many ways, very fulfilling as a son to be able to work with my father on equal terms as an adult, as an artist, uh, and in a business that we had both, you know, gotten into and been into for several years. You know, by the time we did Crucifer, um, I'd been basically making films since 1979. Right. One way or another, as writer, producer, or director. So... You know, again, it wasn't intimidating for me. Uh, but, you know, I've also worked with actors like John Gielgud and, and uh, uh, lots of really famous, you know, Vanessa Redgrave and things like that. And, and I found them incredibly uh, uh, professional and eager to be directed and interested in my opinions on things and willing to discuss. And, and you know, they may have strong opinions about stuff. They may want to do something differently. And we work it out as as you tend to do. You know the right. the sort of Hollywood myth of the impossible actor or actress who just stomps off the stage when they don't get their way. That happens, right? But not that often because you you just don't that doesn't get the movie made. And I think it's more a question of a bunch of dedicated artists rolling up our sleeves, 
trying to get this film made on schedule and on budget and get some reasonable amount of artistic, uh, you know, effect right. uh, in what we're trying to do. So it's it's a lot more workmanlike, I think, once you actually start filming. And, and you know, we all sort of view ourselves as equals, I think. Right. Oh, that's really cool to, to have that type of attitude. Um, now, like, when you're directing this, I imagine, like, when you're directing a play, like, I think probably what would have been different for your father is when he was playing the role of Sherlock on the stage, you can automatically get an immediate reaction to what, Mm -hmm. uh, to like, okay, did I do this right? Maybe I need to make this a little bit more uh, surprising, or maybe I should be a little bit funnier here. Whereas with the play, he, or with the movie, he acts in a certain way. He's not going to get a response for it if he ever does get a response for it until years after the fact, because it's pretty much, and it was, and this was before the internet when it was like 10 minutes in, you're already jumping on Twitter going, I'm bored with this, or this is fantastic. How was that for him? Yeah, you're stuck with it. You're pretty much, I mean, you can make adjustments after previews and people do that a lot. Oddly enough, I don't really like previews. I, I, I do like to watch my films being viewed mm-hmm. by an audience. But the, uh, the problem with previews is, is they'll go, well, the second act was, was slow for me. So the studio will ask you to take something out, which is hugely important simply for the sake of time, but is an enormous plot point, and then you're stuck with this thing that comes out of nowhere in the third act, and you can't explain it. Um, so that you have to be very careful with previews. It's not a democratic process. The audience doesn't get to make the movie, too. Right. Um, you know, if they want to do that, then let's do some interactive thing or something. Right. But, uh, you know, I think with the theater, the beauty of theater is you get an enormous response right away, or a lack thereof. If you don't get a laugh for a funny line, either the line's not funny or you haven't delivered it right. Right, right. Um, or there's something wrong with the way the scene is staged. Right. So you have to look at that and say, let's make an adjustment, because that should be a laugh. Or if you get a bad laugh, you go, oh, I see, it's because I tripped on the carpet and they thought the one thing was connected with the other. Uh, so let's don't do that. Right. Uh, you can change that right away, and you can even within the scene on a given night, you can sense the mood of the audience and kind of go with that a little bit. Um, with film, you're, you're, as I say, you're kind of stuck with it. You have to trust your judgment. Right, right. And, and that's just the nature of the beast. That's the difference between film and Right, theater. right, that's exactly. It. I thought it was a great film. I really enjoyed it. And I had posted on uh, the... Oh, thank I, you. I had posted on the Sherlock Conversations page. I, I saw this several months ago, but I, the one thing that, forgive me, I hope I'm not being rude about this, but... When I saw Richard Johnston, I went, oh, my gosh, he looks like Saddam Hussein. And <laughs> Yeah, with a big mustache. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I was just like – and I just kept going, this is the mother of all Sherlock Holmes movies. <laughs> Certainly the mother of all mustaches. Yeah. Exactly. But his, 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 um, his Sherlock was so – I'm sorry, his Watson was so well done. And what I liked about him was – and where he, where where Richard Johnston contributed to the world of Sherlockdom, for lack of a better phrase, is <laughs> he actually helped save Watson from the Nigel Bruce performance. I, I'm sorry, I'm just one of these people that I do not like Nigel Bruce's performance as Wat, Watson because, like, the mentality for that Watson was. Let's dumb him down to make Sherlock look smarter. Yeah, he was a bumbling buffoon, and and Richard didn't play it that way, and Chuck didn't either. Again, it's a yin and yang, isn't yes. it? You have two two actors who are performing two roles that are almost equal in terms of screen time. They've got to be working together, or it doesn't work at all. And I think they both got that. They had the same interpretation of that part. So I think that's a very prescient thing to say that Chuck's performance complemented Richards in the right way, and Richards' performance obviously contemplated uh, Sherlock. You can't have the one without the other. Right. Um, I do think that you know Nigel Bruce became a sort of quintessential Watson, mainly because we just think of that because they it was so successful. But he was a bumbling buffoon, wasn't he? Yeah. And and if you go back and look carefully at the original, at the, at, the, at the stories. Uh, I, I don't think he's written that way. He's an intelligent, sensitive character who is just occasionally a step behind Sherlock because who isn't, right. after all? Yeah. And Sherlock makes these amazing intuitive leaps and becomes impatient like many brilliant people that think laterally 
you yes. know, to think outside the box or think in four dimensions or five dimensions. Um, that that you, you know Sherlock's impatient with him because he can't keep up. But again, who can? Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but but that's very different from what Nigel Bruce did with it, which you know was effective for that that kind of production. Right, right. Well, the way that I look at it is is that if you're like a Batman purist, because um, I come from a very strong comic book background, I, I write comic mm-hmm. books as well. And yeah. when you look at Batman, and if you look at it over the long haul, from what you saw in the 1930, uh, 1938 all the way to Ben Affleck and everything in between, there are people that view what Adam West and Burt Ward did as something that makes a mockery of the character. And they're just like, mm-hmm. oh, no. And it took Frank Miller, The Dark Knight Returns, the Michael Keaton movies, uh, the first two Michael Keaton movies, um, the Christian Bale movies, and uh, Ben Affleck, is, it took all of that to remember people. Look, you're not dealing with somebody that'll punch a guy in the face and all of a sudden, bam, appears out of nowhere. Um, they, they were looking at it as a broken person. And whereas one of the things that I think Richard Johnston did a really good job of was the Crucifer of Blood – you could imagine being written after the fact by the character that Richard Johnston wrote. I just couldn't imagine mm-hmm. the lady in green that, um, the secret weapon, the adventures that, um, Basil Rathbone wrote, uh, were starting. Well, you don't see Nigel Bruce writing yeah, that stuff. Yeah. You just can't yeah, see that yeah. because. No, no, that's a very good point. Um, because one must always remember that, that, that Watson is both one of our protagonists but he's also our narrator. He's our chief storyteller. Yeah. And we have to come back. It's really done from his point of view, isn't it? Not I mean, occasionally you go off with Sherlock and you get solos, but, but they're reported to Watson. Right. Or you get you get stories. There's a lot of third person storytelling that Watson repeats verbatim. Right. Um and and by the way, therein lies the genius of, of Conan Doyle, isn't it? Yeah. Master master storyteller. Yeah. Um, and look at all the other stuff he wrote, like Lost World and all these amazing things. Yeah. What a, what an imagination. He was yeah. almost a Ray Bradbury uh, sort of character. Yeah, exactly. And he only did yeah. he only did Sherlock. I mean, at some point in time, his mother yelled at him, "You killed off Sherlock! What's wrong with you, Arthur?" Uh, oh, everybody hated him when he killed yeah. him off. I mean, my God, what an uproar! Yeah, he's like, what an uproar! He had to write him back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it really is. It's like it's like going to. Um, it's like going to see the Rolling Stones in concert, and the Ro- and everybody's sitting there going, "Oh, we're going to hear Brown Sugar if you start me up." And uh, mm-hmm. and then they get up there and say, "We're actually going to play some of our favorite jazz hits and classical music pieces." <laughs> and <it's- laughs> yeah, and it turns out Brown Sugar is actually pretty good. Yeah. You know, it may be cliche, but yeah. pretty good. And by the way, we forgot a major thing, which is Robert Downey Jr. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, um, that is a, a I would say that's a sort of modern though still period uh in time frame but very modern take on that character right right exactly. um and and as i understand it uh, the way that film was developed is the producer had the idea to do it as a sort of graphic novel to go back to the comic book thing and he actually had somebody draw up a half a dozen uh sort of scene drawings you know that are like more elaborate frames uh, from a graphic novel, but the graphic novel itself didn't exist until after the film. Right. Uh, which is funny. It was almost like based upon something that, that was never made. But he had this great idea of doing it very dark, but very fast paced, you know, and, and the way, uh, was it Nigel Ritchie uh, who did yeah. it? Um, it was the director, yeah. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. You, you, That's who it is, Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, sorry, Guy Ritchie. Uh, the, the way Guy Ritchie put this thing together was was a very modern kind of uh, a film and, and and with a lot of excitement and action and special effects and the big Hollywood movie yeah. uh, and I think it it kind of stood that you know right. it stood that test right. uh, again shows you the strength of the underlying stories and I think in a weird way I think Conan Doyle would have approved of that right right let me ask this though what um because when you look at your career you've had a very very amazing career I mean I'm just doing a quick look at your Wikipedia page and you've gone on to do um uh you you did some work for City Slickers you did you directed ne- uh, Needful Things which had some mm-hmm. amazing actors in that and then you did Alaska Max Bonfito and Ed, Ed Harris Bonnie Bedelia yeah and then you went on to make a um 
uh, documentary about uh, the search for Michael Rockefeller. And, yeah. And whatever stopped you from doing another Sherlock movie with your father? Did uh, you know? I, I that's a good question. We, we didn't have a quick answer right away, and and there were other things that we wanted to do instead. Um, we, we didn't have another Crucifer of Blood on the hook, as it were. So we got into other projects and and went off in different directions. So that as as sometimes happens. So there was never any conscious decision not to do it, but we just didn't have one in mind. And maybe that was a mistake. Maybe we should have had one planned while we were filming. Mm. Um, but but one never knows where these well, things are going to go. Well, I would imagine that with a creator like you, because like you get some people that are kind of like they're uh, they they kind of put themselves in a genre and then they just run with it and. Yeah. Whereas, like somebody like uh, Wes Craven, who it's been uh, I, I'm his, the anniversary of his passing, and he wanted to do romantic comedies, but everybody was like, "No, we want to see your horror stuff." <laughs> Poor guy. <gosh. laughs> yeah. And and but I would imagine yeah. though that once you did Treasure Island, you're like, you know, we don't need to do another pirate movie. And once you did Sherlock, we're like, we did a Sherlock Holmes movie. We don't need to do another one. Let's yeah, there's a, there's a degree of that. There's a degree of of let's go on and do something new. You know, let's not get stuck doing the same thing over and over again. Hollywood doesn't like that attitude, by the way. They want to pigeonhole you and they want you to do stuff that they're comfortable with you doing because you've already done it. Um, and that's why Wes Craven and all these guys sort of get stuck in that. You don't see Wes Craven going off and doing Shakespeare, you know, or Sleepless in Seattle if he liked romantic comedy. Right, right, um, right. Uh, you, you just, <laughs> Wes Craven, Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> it gives it a whole different connotation, exactly. doesn't it? Exactly. It's like, why haven't you slept? serial killers jumping on you. Yeah, it's like, why haven't but, you slept? I was on the Space Needle, and I haven't slept in 30 hours, because if I fall asleep, there's this guy with a burned face and claws. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That, wait a minute. That sounds good. Let's do that. Which is... Um, so, you know, I think uh, I should tell you that I did develop another uh, Conan Doyle story, but it wasn't a Sherlock Holmes. So we developed uh, uh, for Castle Rock Entertainment a script called uh, Lot 249, which is a wonderful story, which is basically one of the original mummy stories, I think written oh, uh, maybe even before Bram Stoker's mummy. Um, and Lot 249 is about a... Uh, a sarcophagus that is uh, sold off at an English country auction, and and the mummy inside is able to be brought back to life if you have the right spells and incantations. Oh, and, that's and awesome. the, the the evil heart to to pull it off, and uh, it, it's taken back to Oxford University, and uh, uh, the plot unfolds there from the point of view of a, of a medical student at Oxford, um, and we did we did actually both a period version. And, you know, one said in the 1890s and a contemporary version because we said, you know, this could happen today. And and, and the mummy was a, a very kind of creepy right. character who moved very quickly. It didn't move into the old limp and stagger that Boris Karloff's mummy moved. Right, with, you know, right. It was really fast, like a big spider, and it was just terrible. Oh, that's, that's so So uh, that's something we still own that script, and we'd love to, uh, to get that made. Well, at the very least, you could get it made into a graphic novel. There's always companies out there, there, out there looking for a good graphic novel, so... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so, right. Fraser, I can't even thank you for your time today. Uh, th this has just been absolutely so wonderful. And and it, um, I'm going to tell people that the best thing they could do is check out Agamemnon Productions, which is a mouthful. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm going to have links to all of this stuff, and I'll have a link to the uh, right. Amazon store so that they could get uh, this Desolation Sound. And, oh, wonderful. And that way they can pick it up. And uh, more or less, um, I was going to ask, has there been any talk, because we are right now in a Sherlock renaissance. I mean, of all things that they just announced, they said that um, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley were going to be playing Holmes in a comedy. And is there any talk of reissuing Crucifer of Blood, or would there be any discussion of it? Because I think there would be enough of an audience out there on some level just to have, like, a, here's a behind-the-scenes look, here's uh, some fun that we had, just, you know, like, uh, just your basic, here's, like, some video, pictures of Dad behind the scenes, pictures of Richard Johnston doing stuff, and... Uh, well, there there hasn't been, but I think that's a great idea. Uh, we, you know, TNT still owns it. 
Uh, I believe there is a, a DVD available. And uh, let's start a writing campaign and start bombarding uh, TNT with requests to do an encore presentation. And I'll be happy to come out and, and, and do some uh, behind-the-scenes interviews. That would be really cool. I will be more than happy to do that. We'll see if we can awesome. get, get some sort of uh, – <laughs> you know, look, if we, can get, uh, if we can get enough people to sign a petition to get Justin Bieber kicked out of the United States, we should be able to get <laughs> – <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, we should be able to get. Uh, or better money. yet, better yet, let's get Lot Two Four Nine made. Let's get TNT to do that one, that would and be a lot uh, of then we'll have a new uh, Conan Doyle. Well, for our, and I don't think that's been made, has it? No, no, it hasn't. I mean, it would be. I don't think so. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, it's a great story. It's a full-length novel. I mean, it's a lovely, lovely, creepy, creepy story. Really fun. Yeah, well, let's do that. But in the meantime, yeah. we can at least tell people they can check out Desolation Sound to see what an amazing writer that you great. there are. Great. Yeah, we're working on on the sequel right now. In fact, it's called uh, High, It's called River of Tears about oh, the wow. uh, missing. The missing women who've disappeared along one highway in Canada, oh, more than 40 of them over the last 20 years. Oh, that's so funny. You guys really should be yeah. going out of your way to uh, hop on the Paranormal Podcast circuit. <laughs> Absolutely. And sharing this. With <laughs> I love them. the unsolved mystery. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You guys have uh, you doing a really wonderful job with this. I, I would do that. The podcast. Uh, well, Rockefeller, Rockefeller as well was an unsolved mystery. Yeah. In a way, you know, what, what happened to Michael in New Guinea? Was he eaten by cannibals? Did he drown at sea? Did he decide to stay there and live amongst the natives? What exactly happened to him? And there's no solution to that as of, as of now. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. And the other thing that's great is, is that if people are not familiar with the story of Michael Rockefeller, they can see it on your website and see what it's about and actually get the DVD there. They can, and they can watch it on Netflix as well. If they subscribe to Netflix, you can get a streaming there. Oh, really? Okay, I did not realize that. Yeah, it's that. called the search, the search for Michael Rockefeller. Okay, well, I've got something I'm going to be doing later today. Great, enjoy it, yeah. <laughs> I definitely will. Um, okay. Fraser, thank you so much for your time today. This has just been our our pleasure here. We have, I have had oh, so great. much fun, and um, I hope we can have you on again. Just talking about any. Well, Don, Don, thank you very much, and thank your audience and your readers and your your web world for uh, uh, having as much interest in this subject as I do. It's really wonderful to know that there are as as you know that many people out there that are passionate about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's work and Sherlock Holmes. It, yeah, it's exactly. Really gratifying. It is. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure, Don. Okay. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Uh, all right. Bye-bye. Bye. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. This is Don Smith. I am your host. <laughs>